Miles Wiley Albright, ninth day of the ninth month of 2024. Um, Bible in the Bar, Hobbs Island Pit Stop, Huntsville, Alabama, USA. And let's pray. Lord, we love you and we bless you and we honor you. We really do. We honor you. And we thank you for honoring us. You've honored us so much it's humbled us. Thank you, sir, for your word, the word of God. And for this series of, of going deep into the word of God. And sifting out the word by the word. Help us and make this valuable forever. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, we're in John chapter 12. And uh, again, we're, we're, we're in a series here of looking at chapters in, in John through the ninth verse of John, John 1, 9, which says, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world, which is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. It's about the incarnation of Christ, but it's also about his divinity in that he is and was speaking to every person all the time. And that God, the Son of God, God the Son, who was in the Father and the Father in him, was speaking to every man, the conscience of every man. And this has become uh, one of the main topics of really of my life. Even our, our girls were always raised on the phrase, everybody knows the truth, but not everybody receives the truth. In other words, God's talking to everybody all the time, but not everybody listens, heeds, learns from God. And it's part of the answer to the question about what about the pagans that's never heard the gospel? How, you know, will they all go to hell? Well, Romans 2, verses 12 through 16, is very clear about those who have not the law. That is, they have not the Bible. They have not the teaching of Christ as we know it, but they, their consciences are being spoken to by God and Jesus Christ will judge them in the last day by how they responded to that conscience. That is a very important teaching. It's also very important to know that we're all responsible because we all have light. The light of Christ, the true light that gives light to every man. So we've gone through these chapters and sifted through each verse and looked at them through the lens of this one verse. So if you've ever had a, a, a Bible lesson where you were studying the Scripture by the Scripture, this is it. This is painstakingly taking one verse and looking at a whole book. It's not just some proof text and very shallow application or understanding. It's a very deep understanding of the very word of God and how the Holy Spirit wrote the book of John through John and how he chose to write about every man's conscience being spoken to by the very person who walked the shores of Galilee in sandals. So, I've enjoyed it immensely. I have learned to believe this. I mean, this has been an old teaching with, with us, even with my family. But this has really gone deeper for me, and I've enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I, don't look to, look, I don't look forward to this being over. Uh, it'll change a little bit after this chapter, I think. But we'll see. We'll see. Now, with that in mind, true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world as Christ. 
we begin in John chapter 12, verse 1. Now, the context here is, of course, John 11. And John 11 is where Jesus has done his ultimate miracle other than his own resurrection. His ultimate miracle is to raise a man from the dead who's been in the tomb four days. He's probably been dead five days. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived in, at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, he's arriving in Bethany, and that's where Lazarus and his sisters live. But you might presume that uh, that this is the house of Lazarus and Mary Martha, but it's not. Uh, Matthew tells us this is the home of Simon the leper, who's probably a, a wealthier person, bigger house. By now, Jesus actually had to flee after he raised Lazarus from the dead, and and that's when the last part of chapter 11. And he had to go get out of, out of Dodge for a while and then come back. So he's here. He's What he's doing, he's controlling his own destiny of when he's going to be arrested and killed by the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the chief priests. And he's not resisting his own death but he is resisting being taken before it's time. He's controlling everything in his behavior. Okay, so he's heading for, well, he's six days from the Passover, and this is the Passover where he will, where he'll be killed. He'll be the Passover lamb in six days. And so he's bringing himself back into danger. And he's going to stay, keep from being killed for a few more days, and then he's going to let them take him. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at table with him. That doesn't say it's Lazarus' house. He's just there. Martha's there. Martha's actually serving. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. You know, somebody pointed out a long time ago that that last sentence is the sentence written by somebody who was there. That's not a remark you would you would make. It, you know, like Luke is getting a lot of his stuff secondhand. He's he's interviewing Mary. He's interviewing Peter, James, John. But this is John writing his own recollection. And he says, and the house was filled with the fragrance. That's what a person who was actually there writes. Think about that. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Now, that's a very profound passage if you if you think about this okay jesus knows everything jesus knew who he had chosen and he'd chosen one that was a devil but judas doesn't believe jesus knows everything judas has been is a so to speak a victim of the, of the grace of god and the grace of god can become a license for sin. In other words, if you see God blessing you, even you're, while you're still doing wrong, it can cause you to not repent of the wrong, in fact, to do more wrong. If, if Jesus is blessing Judas so much that he's giving him the power to heal the sick and raise the dead, the, and at the same time, he is stealing money from the money bag, then he really is having a certain contempt for Jesus. Yeah, Jesus has got power, and Jesus can convey power, and I saw my, my own hands open the eyes of the blind, Judas is thinking. I saw my own hands, you know, heal a cripple. I even prayed for God to be raised from the dead, and he was raised from the dead because he sent them out two by two, and Judas had to be part of a situation like that, and yet he was stealing from the bag. 
That's what's called the hardening of blessing. The grace of God, if your heart is hard, if God shows you grace, gifts, power, can become a license for sin. Because if you don't deal with your sin and God blesses you and you keep sinning and he keeps blessing you, you think, well, I can have my cake and eat it too. I can be a thief and still have the power of God. And that, over time, think about it, caused Judas to really come to the point of almost having contempt for Jesus as far as Jesus is real power. And at the same time, the deceiver was being deceived. That's in Isaiah. The deceiver will be deceived. And he, who was a liar, thief, was being deceived by his own duplicity. Think about it. And he got to the point where he was so brazen in, in stealing from the bag that his attitude was like, you know, I, you know, 30% belongs to me. And any, any money that don't wind up in the bag where I can get my 30%, I feel like I'm being robbed. Think about it. How low you would have to go to get to that place. He's seeing abject worship. A woman was a lot more vulnerable financially than a man. And we're pretty sure that Mary was not married in her savings account. You know, you could have your savings account in gold or silver or whatever, or you could have it in this nard stuff. And she, led by the Spirit of God, takes her whole, probably her whole life savings and pours it on Jesus. And they're within a week of burying Jesus. So when Jesus is hanging on the cross, the fragrance of this will still be there. The fragrance of her worship will still be on Jesus' body when he's bloodied. Think about that. And she, she has seen Jesus raised from the dead, her beloved, beloved brother, after she was reproaching Jesus for letting it happen. She was angry that Jesus had not come through and got there in time to keep Lazarus from dying. And then after he'd been dead four plus days, it was just over. It's just too late. And so she bitter, was bitter and angry. And then he comes through like the cavalry coming over the hill at the last minute and raises her brother from the dead. And she is doing abject worship. And Judas looks at that and resents the fact that he couldn't cash in on that. Hmm. You know, I'm the one time that I have been a pastor and we built a church. We built very simple metal building, no, no, uh, no steeple, no anything. Very simple, very functional. Um, but I don't need to be self righteous about that and criticize a church building that was built and the people's motivation was the glory of God. I don't want to walk up to a beautiful cathedral and say, why this waste? Who said, why this waste? Who said, why this waste? Judas said, why this waste? I don't know the motivation of those who built that cathedral. I don't know if it should have been spent to help the poor. In this case, this extravagant use of these finances here, was the right thing to do, regardless of how many poor people were in Jerusalem, Bethany. It was right. So let's just be careful, lest we criticize those who extravagantly worship the Lord. We wouldn't. Let's don't be Judas. But Judas gets out there, sticks his neck way out there. He's really criticizing the Spirit of God for calling for this extravagant worship. And he's gradually got there. 
and the timing has been all from the Lord because he's a setup. His flesh is a setup. He's doing his own will. But God in his sovereign knows exactly how this is going to play out. And he's going to betray the Christ. And part of the reason he's going to betray the Christ is because he's going to be rebuked right here, publicly. Right in front of the other apostles. And by the way, he wasn't the only one who said, why this waste? The other gospels tell us that it wasn't just Judas that said that. But it was only Judas who said it out of this raw mercenary motive, love of money. It was different with him. Don't you know the others got goose pimples when they thought about they joined with Judas and criticizing Mary's worship after they realized exactly what was happening after the resurrection. Wow. That would have been a, a scary moment. Okay. Now, Jesus says in verse 7, leave her alone. Jesus replied, it was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So it's been several days. We don't know how long Jesus had retreated after he raised Lazarus. But now everybody's going crazy about this Jesus guy because it's Lazarus is a well-known fellow. They know he's dead. They know he was raised from the dead after four plus days. Jesus, and this is this is really awesome. But he's out of town because he's in danger because they want to kill him. The authorities want to kill him more than ever because they're really getting in danger of losing their power to this. Jack leg, gen, uh, Jack leg, uh, Galilean evangelist, and they don't want to lose their position. But he's gotten out of town. Now he comes into town. They're getting close to the Passover. People are starting to arrive. Crowds are getting bigger. Uh, everybody's talking about the Lazarus thing, and so they decide to have a party to honor Jesus. And with Lazarus there, and apparently they choose the home of Simon the leper, which is probably a, a larger home than the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And yet, outside this, everybody would have been crowding trying to get in there. But outside this building, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there. Where? At this Simon the leper's house. They came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus. It's starting to be a, like a rock star thing whom he raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. They're trying to put out the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. And not only had he been speaking to the conscience of every person, but now he's, he's doing works that testify of him in a way that no one has ever been testified about before. I mean, his very words are so winsome and so awesome that even the temple guards who didn't know the Bible said, no man ever spoke like this man. But also on top of that, he has the witness of these miracles and, and this crowning miracle with, with the resurrection of Lazarus is really starting to attract some serious attention. And they're either got to back up and say, look, he must be the Messiah or, and let's just give up our position and, and do whatever it takes to follow him. Or, They've got to not only kill him, but try to put out the light that he's lit over here in, the, in Lazarus's life. And that's pretty dark. It's pretty awful. But it's amazing, the love of money, the love of position, what people would do to even try to kill the light, to kill the Son of God, to preserve their position. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus, putting their faith in him. Now, let's think about that. On account of him, okay, does that mean they just looked at him and said, well, that, there he is. But now, wait, maybe, maybe they weren't even familiar with what Lazarus looked like. I think what that means is they walk up to him and say, is it true? 
And he goes, yeah, it's true. I was gone four days. I was in the bosom of Abraham. I saw Abraham. I saw Isaac. I saw Jacob. I saw David. I talked to Jeremiah. I talked to, yes, and this is what they looked like, and this is what they said. In other words, because of Lazarus, not just they see him, that wouldn't necessarily be that impressive. But if he says, look, yeah, it happened. I was there. I was on the other side. And it's all true. He's the Messiah. And they're waiting on him on the other side. Abraham's excited when I told him what's going on up here. Think about it. Because of Lazarus, they're starting to believe. That's a pretty good witness. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting. Okay, so the other three Gospels tell us about the triumphal entry and Jesus on the donkey and people saying, Hosanna, 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 blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They tell us about that, but they don't tell us why that was sudden, almost riot happened. But John tells us, and it's, it's because of what has happened with Lazarus. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it as it is written. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. That's the, the other gospels tell us this too. They went and got the donkey. They made the arrangement and everything, but they didn't realize what they, that they were fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. 9. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him in Zechariah and that they had done these things to him. They go, whoa, yeah, we did that. We actually fulfilled Zechariah. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. What word? Well, the word of the guy that raised Lazarus from the dead. And somebody said he healed a man born blind. He's coming. Many people, because they had heard that they had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. And now so the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And it appears at that point in time, yes, that the whole world has gone after him. And they're starting to, to get the light, not just the light of their conscience, but the light of the testimony of Lazarus and the other miracles that Jesus has done. And they're starting to say, okay, this has got to be the guy. So there's a light coming from that besides the light that's coming to every man's conscience. But those who have a vested interest in him not be, you know, being received him as a Messiah are going to try to put out the light. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. Okay, we're getting close to the Passover again. At the beginning of this chapter, we were six days out. And so these Greeks, Greek, they're Greek Jews. They're Greek by nationality, but they've been converted to Judaism. And so they've come all the way from Greece, which is a long trip for them, expensive. They've come all the way to Jerusalem. And all the way up in Greece, there would have been talk. There would have been news. They, they probably had heard about it before maybe they even left Greece about Lazarus. They certainly had heard the other stories. And they're, these are Greek people who had previously been converted to Judaism who are now saying, oh, we're, we came, became Jews just in time for the real Messiah because apparently the real Messiah is here. So they came to Philip, that is these Greeks who had been converted to Judaism. They came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request, Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Wow. I think the whole world wants to see Jesus, at least in part of their hearts. Philip went to, and to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus, Jesus is going to be busy right now. There's huge crowds. So these two apostles get together and they say, hey, look, we even got Greeks coming in here. And Greeks was the sophisticates of the day. The Jews in general were very impressed by the Greeks. They're the ones with the education and secular 
secular influence. And so you've, call, you've crossed a Rubicon here. You've crossed a point where Jesus is starting to get to be internationally famous. And of course, this is not a surprise to Jesus, but it is a clear indication that if he's ever going to be crucified, it's got to be now. Because he's getting to be too popular. When the when there's a past a certain point of everybody saying, okay, he must be the Messiah, then he will never be crucified. You know, many times when Jesus would do a miracle, he would say, don't go tell anybody. Why was that? Because he, all of his life, had one foot on the accelerator and one foot on the brake to do what he was called to do without becoming too popular because job one for Christ was not to teach or to heal. As important as those were, job one was to die and rise from the dead and atone for our sins and redeem the whole world. Remember this. This is something that, you know, Barbara and I talk about all the time in our Bible studies. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before there was Adam and Eve, before there were lambs and sheep, the scripture says, in Revelation 13, that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He knew in God that they were going to make free will beings that would rebel. And, and in order for that to not be a disaster, but to be a family, a loving family who had been there, done that, been redeemed by the blood of God, he knew that he would have to die and redeem them. From the very beginning and so jesus is now coming down to the last six days he's coming in for a landing the landing at calvary you know over in luke 12 i believe it says jesus says i have a baptism to be baptized with and how i'm constrained until it is accomplished in other words i'm going to have to be baptized in death suffering in death and I'm constrained. What does that mean? Well, partly what that means is he has to keep one foot on the brake, constrained. He has to keep himself from becoming too popular, too quick, because he has to die. So in, in, the, in the Father's sovereignty, God's controlling stuff, but also Jesus in, in the natural down here is controlling things. One foot on the gas and one foot on the brakes. That's what's going on here. So Jesus replied, after they say you're becoming internationally famous, the Greeks are here, you know, they've come, they've come here wanting to, you know, see you. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, okay, which clearly means death, burial, and resurrection. It clearly means exactly opposite what the devil thought. When the devil hears Jesus say he's about to be glorified, he's thinking, no, he ain't about to be glorified. He's about to be shamed. He's about to be dishonored. I'm going to do my best to kill the guy, get him stripped naked, beat to a pulp, and naked, hung on a pole on the edge of town, hung on a cross by the roadside. And, and there he'll be, naked as he can be, beat to a pulp, and he'll be the shame of all shame, the curse of all cursed. He's not going to be glorified. What the devil doesn't know, and what the Pharisees, the chief priests, the what they didn't know is he was going to be glorified by the very thing they thought would shame him. He was going to be able to be in eternal life and give eternal life by receiving death. That's that's the wisdom of God that is above the wisdom of man. The time has come for him to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. Well, remember that. But if it does die, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. 
In other words, if you will sow your life, you will reap life. If you'll give up your life every hour, every minute, you'll give up your right to complain. Give up your right to be angry. That will make you able to sow. You've got to be a kernel of wheat falling in the ground to die to bear fruit. Whoever serves me must follow me. We'll follow him to the cross. We're called to the cross. And where I am, my servant also will be. Wow. You want to be with Jesus? Obey him in receiving suffering in his will. Where I am, my servant will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. I want that. Let me shamelessly say that I want to be honored by God. I want to be honored by God. And I fully realize that means that I will have to re embrace rejection and dishonor by men many times. Many times. Maybe most of the time. All right. Now my heart, this is Jesus saying, now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. In, in the margin of my Bible, I have Luke 12, 49 written there because that's where, he, where it says, I just quoted that, that I have a baptism to be baptized with and how I'm constrained until it's accomplished. He knew he was the lamb from the foundation of the earth. Before he was a, a human baby, he always knew that that was his destiny. He could not be avoided. Then a voice of all things, you hear the voice of the Father here. This is amazing. You hear the voice of the Father at his baptism. You hear the voice of the Father audibly at the transfiguration. And here, right before his suffering his death, you hear the voice of the Father speaking out loud. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. He's already glorified Jesus by what he's given him the power to do. But the real glory is coming in a surprise way to the whole world. The crowd that was there heard it, said that it had thundered, and others said an angel had spoken to him. I don't fully understand exactly what all is going on there, but partly to those who had ears to hear, they could hear a physical voice say exactly this. But those who did not have ears to hear couldn't even hear a physical voice speaking from heaven. They thought, well, it just thundered. You know, this is about the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Think about it. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And the devil is probably hearing that going, no, I'm not about to be driven out. You're the one that's about to be driven out, driven out, tortured, and crucified. But the devil doesn't understand the plans of God. If he had have, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay, so, so the prince of the world now will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. So he's referring to crucifixion, which is where you're lifted up from the earth. Um, and he's saying that, you know, this is <clears throat> strange to these people. If they're saying, well, he's talking about crucifixion. How will that cause him to, you know, people to come to him? They didn't get it, but Jesus did get it. In fact, much of what's written here in the rest of John, Jesus is writing it saying, you don't understand this, but I'm on my way to die. And you don't understand this, that you're, you're not born again now, and you can't be born again until I do die. Because you can't be saved until you believe in the resurrection, and you can't believe in the resurrection until I rise from the dead. And so what I'm getting is going over your head. But later this will make sense to you, but right now it don't make sense to you. And, it's, and the disciples are going, duh, no, it don't make sense. The crowd spoke up 
we have heard that from the law that the Christ will remain forever. That's their understanding. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Because they're thinking that Son of Man being lifted up is his crucifixion and death. Who is this Son of Man? So they're totally oblivious to really what's happening here. Then Jesus told them, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. At the end of this paragraph, he's going to disappear and get out of town. But think about it. He's speaking natural, material, audible words right now to a crowd, and they're fixing to lose that. The true light that gives light to every man speaking in their conscience, but now he's speaking audibly so you can hear him. But this is fixing to come to an end. You're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before the darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. Put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of light. In other words, start believing in me now even though you don't understand. There's part of your heart that tells you to believe in me even though you don't have a clue. Not even Peter, James, and John really have a clue what I'm saying here. But believe anyway. Believe in anyway. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. So, in other words, the doors are quickly closing for them to hear the Son of God speak audibly. Now, they're going to be able to hear from the Holy Spirit later on. They're going to understand the gospel a lot better in, in a couple of weeks. But right now, they're, they're losing an opportunity to hear him in the natural. All right. Even after, notice what's fixing to be said here. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence. In other words, the true light that gives light to every man was shining particularly bright to them, not just in their conscience, because, but he's done all these miracles. And that's what this story is about. There are those who, who have light, great light shown to them and they refuse to hear it. And that was also happening in Isaiah's time. And that's what's going, he's going to cite here. And again, this is about the true light that gives light to every man. And it, that it was always that way, even back in Isaiah's time. It, let me read this again. Even after Jesus had done all these th miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not, if you will, out there in listening land, say would not. Think about it. They would not believe in him. It's not that they, that they it wasn't available to them, but they were, there was a choice. They would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed the message and who, to whom is the arm of the Lord been revealed. That's what Isaiah said after he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up sitting on the throne. John, uh, Isaiah 6. He saw Jesus. He saw the pre-incarnate Christ right there in the temple and the ground shook. And yet he knew in that moment he was sent out with a message that most of them would refuse to hear. Same thing going on when Jesus is actually here in sandals. For this reason, they could not believe. Wait a minute. Because as Isaiah, it says elsewhere, he's blinded their eyes and dead in their hearts. All right, back up. You got a would not there. And you got a could not there. Draw a circle, I would suggest, around would not and could not and draw a line from one to the other. Because they refused to believe, they got to a point where they couldn't believe. Say, so, well, God's blinding their eyes. He's making them where they're stupid. He's only making them have more of what they're choosing. They're choosing blindness. That's what this book is about about light, truth, blindness, deliberate blindness. They could not believe, so they would not believe, so they could not believe. We read this again, verse 39. For this reason they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, is blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts, so that they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this, get this, because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Isaiah literally saw Jesus' glory 
sitting on a throne in Isaiah chapter 6. Physically, he saw his glory. But what in this chapter, the glory of God is when he's talking about when Jesus dies and is raised from the dead. Guess what else? Isaiah also saw that aspect of his glory. Isaiah 53, more clearly probably than any chapter in the Old Testament, is where he sees the, the death, the burial, the torture, the suffering of Christ, and how that will atone for our sins. Isaiah 53, 12 verses there. In other words, Isaiah saw Jesus on a throne, but he also saw him on a cross. Both were glorious. But his greatest glory is his death, burial, and resurrection. Isaiah saw his glory and spoke about him. You know, the whole Bible is about Jesus. Ah, remember that would not, could not. That's, that's where we're going. Yet at the same time, we're almost through here. At the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. They did believe in him, but, there's a but, they're believers, but, with a but. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise from God. Were these people who believed, it says they believed, were they believing unto salvation? I don't know. I kind of doubt it. They believe, but if you want to put actions to your faith, without actions, your faith is dead faith. Were these people saved? I don't know. Maybe after the resurrection, they said, look, I don't care about the praise of man anymore. But if you, if you care about the praise of man too much to confess your belief, then your faith is probably dead, according to James. Then Jesus cried out, when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. That's the Father. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light. Here we are again, the true light that gives light to every man. I've come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. You could believe in him and possibly stay in darkness. But if you're really listening to the light, you'll be willing to be a grain of wheat that falls in the ground and dies. You'll be willing to hate your life and receive your life. Simple as that. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, okay? Maybe that's talking about these who supposedly believed. But does not keep them. I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world but to save it, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. I know we're, we've been going on a while here, but listen to me. That was exceedingly important. He's saying that in the last day, the words I have spoken to him will judge him in the last day and how he's received them. Think about this. This is not just written for a few people that were in immediate earshot of Jesus speaking for a few hours in a certain place in a certain location. This Bible is written, these verses are written for more than those few people. Think about it. It would be crazy for it not to be. This is not even going to be written down for another 50 years, these words. But this is bigger than that. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world, and everybody will be judged by how they respond to the word that he is speaking in their hearts, whether or not they got to hear him audibly or not. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very word which I speak spoke will condemn him at the last day the words i've been speaking to you you're responsible for remember let's go back to remind you before we finish here we're almost finished go to romans 2 and let's let's hear that about the words that's been spoken even to those who do not have the law who have not heard the word of god who have not heard you know audibly who have not heard the bible audibly romans 2 12 
get this, try to receive this. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. There are some who don't really have a written Bible, but there's some who do. For it is not those who hear the law, the Bible, who are righteous in God's sight, but those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law, they don't have a scripture, do by nature things required by the law, their law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, their thoughts now even accusing, not even defending them, and this will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. There it is. That's the witness to what he's saying here. They will be judged by how they responded to the word they had. And again, most of these people here did not, were not an earshot of Jesus. If they did, could they even remember it three days later? How many of them got a copy of John 50 years later? Almost none. But still, they've been spoken to by the sovereign God, who is Christ. For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I love that verse. But the, the Father is speaking through the Son to everybody. And God is speaking. You know, he's speaking to somebody in, in South Mongolia and North America through the trees, the bushes, the, the bird nest. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. So whatever he says in the scripture here, but also whatever he says to the everyman who will never have a copy of the Bible. If they do, they may be illiterate. They may not be able to read it. This is a, a scripture that's about every man in all the world spoken to by God, who is Christ, the true light that gives light to every man who came into the world. Thank you, Lord, for this chapter. Thank you for the privilege of getting to bring this. I pray you make us all teachers in Jesus' name. Amen.